All right, since that's recording, hello everybody. I just like to invite everyone to this interview that I'm gonna do with the editor of Retablo and my close college friend, Jake Lee. How are you doing, Jake? I'm good, how are you? I'm doing great, thank you. I, I guess we'll just get right into it. So Jake, I know that in your spare time, you like making, you know, just edits of your favorite films, you know, Marvel and Star Wars come up to mind of just like films that you just like to make your own version, your own cut of it. What started, what made you like start like making your own, I guess, versions of the films? Uh, so it's, it came from one specific uh, edit that I had in mind. Um, and this was when the finale of the Clone Wars series had finally aired on Disney Plus. Um, and it, it crossed over like while, like it, it takes place during uh, Star Wars Episode 3. And so I'm like, you know, it'd be cool is to see these two storylines like stitched together into one story. And so I just kind of sat down and I recorded them off of my computer uh using my like built-in like screen recorder and this was like a like a straight up six hour process as my computer fought me on getting all of the content off of disney plus um and i i had a free trial on premiere pro and so i was just kind of stitching it together with uh poorly recorded audio very glitchy and stuttery video and it was just, it was a process that I eventually built up and uh, perfected over time. And I managed to get better sources for this footage. I managed to like, to, to get better editing. And over time, as I've practiced with other projects and other movies where I've been like, oh, I, here's a movie I like, but could have been better. And I know a couple fixes I can make. I just kind of kept switching it in and out. Um, through that kind of method and it has gotten me noticed on a couple different platforms where I've actually like released my edits. Do you think you can do a better job than the ones already at Marvel? Uh, no, um, I will never claim that I can do a better job than the original filmmakers. It's just things that like it, I see it more as like if I were in charge of the edit, this is how I would approach it. Or sometimes it's like maybe I just want to see an alternate version and so, like, you know, I'll find the deleted scenes for a movie and I'll just put them back in the movie to see what that movie would have looked like with those scenes still included. You know, it's just, it's just kind of like I'm looking for alternate versions. I'm not looking to fix any, like, movies. You know, there's only one movie that I think needs fixing, and that's Suicide Squad. <laughs> and I know that your love of films goes more you know further than just editing them i know that you had a, like a childhood wealthy of just films that you've watched and that you were just obsessed over can you tell me more about those films that just got you into loving movies yeah so i know i've uh specifically spoken to you about this story um but i will go ahead and repeat it for the sake of this interview um there's the the old um special edition vhs tapes of the original Star Wars trilogy that my parents had when I was growing up in Franklin, Iowa, where it was the movies that were like remastered in the nineties with like new special effects and shots and scenes and whatnot. Um, and at the beginning of these tapes, there was an interview with George Lucas and the creators at ILM who helped work on these new special editions of the movies where they would talk about going into the special effects and how the certain shots were achieved and how they differed from the original version of the movie and stuff like that. Um, and I watched these tapes to death. Like one of the tapes straight up does not work now. Um, and it's just because I loved seeing like that. Like it's kind of like it's kind of like at the end of The Wizard of Oz when they pull back the curtain and you see the man behind the curtain except I'm more interested in the gadgets that the man was operating to get his face projected on the screen like that. Like, I want to know what kind of artistry, craft, and, like, technical ability goes into that. And so I've just sort of spent a majority of my life, like, watching movies and being like, how do you think they achieved these effects? How do you think they, uh, you know, got that done? Why did they choose to do this in the story? And it's, you know, just seeing that, has made me want to learn the craft myself and get into it. It's just, that's just kind of where I come from. So I understand that you are studying film in college and that, you know, 
from there you would like to bounce on yourself, maybe be a freelancer. Is there a, do you would like to grow in more of a director role, an editor role, anything like that has to do with composition? All of it. <laughs> um, I actually, my mom just asked me this question like earlier this week uh, and asked like what I specifically want to go into. And I don't really have a good answer because I would love to direct. I've directed one whole play. I've directed a scene for another play. And I've directed a bunch of like short films for different classes. But also I've written for different short films for classes. And obviously I had to edit those videos too. And I love editing with like fresh like sources and footage because it's like it's like a puzzle where the pieces aren't cut out yet. And you have to sort of figure out how those like fit together in yourself and see what creates the best image. But also the editing also comes in from videos that uh, either already existed, like fan edits of movies that were made where you're just fine tuning someone else's work or uh, like specifically uh, when I did uh, recordings of the plays that they've shown at, at, at the college I go to where uh, I sit down with a camera, record the entire play, and then I can edit the video later. And like specifically the directors of those plays asked me to do that so that they could have those archived for their own uses. Can you see yourself working in a more like college setting or university setting when it comes to film, maybe be a director of a couple like local plays or would you like to go straight to Hollywood? <laughs> um, I definitely want to work on on actual like feature films like things that go to theaters that or I mean the big thing now is like streaming so I guess like I'd like to see my stuff end up somewhere um, I wouldn't be mad if I ended up as like a college professor but that's not what I'm here for would you see, like to see yourself maybe start from the ground up I understand you know you're just a filmmaker in school and you just want to, you know, have this passion. Would you like to, you know, make your own like indie film, something small and start from there? Or would you just like to have something big budget? A little of both. I would love to make like an indie film uh, specifically because I truly believe creativity can be stemmed from almost a lack of resources. Like if you're given like a limited budget, and you can only do so much and you can't do special effects it forces you to be more creative with what you can do um like in your actual film because you can't just fix everything in post you can't throw an infinite number of money at it like you have to make sure that it's good and that your creativity really comes to fruition there because it's, it's a logic puzzle almost it's like fitting it together and seeing how yeah. it all comes together so like i would love to do an indie film and i've told you about this one screenplay that I've been writing for a while uh, and I would love to make that as an indie film where I'm also not only do I have the creative limitations where I you know would be forced to make the movie as creatively as possible but also indie films give their directors a lot more creative freedom you know you get better color grading you can be more experimental with the audio and music and the editing you know you don't have to appeal to a mainstream audience there's a movie that came out recently, and I forget what it's called, but it was made for $10,000. Like, that was literally the whole budget of the movie. And the whole premise of the movie is um, this guy and his wife get into a car accident, and the guy dies, but the wife lives. Um, and the whole movie, he's a ghost, and he, uh, like, he rejects going to the afterlife, and he just stays in his home with his wife. Uh, forever um, and he has to watch as she slowly gets over grieving him and starts a new family with someone else and Ouch. The whole, yeah and the whole movie like they don't do any like fun special effects with him where he's like half transparent or whatever they literally have him in like the classic like halloween like bed sheet with those so like just, just just <laughs> so like uh like a little halloween costume you go to the dollar store you get like um you just a big white sheet cut two holes yeah but it's it's a beautiful film though because it's shot and it looks gorgeous like those like those film uh pictures that you took on your camera it looks like it was shot on that like it's it's a gorgeous movie to look at and it's it forced its director into like a creative limitation and you know that's how they created the image of him as a ghost but like in a bedsheet like that 
and I just think it's it's so cool that they got a you know not that I got away with it but they they were able to do that on the footnote though because you asked like if I also wanted to do big budget uh right now uh Marvel actually weirdly enough offers up a lot of opportunities for lesser known directors like um Taika Waititi blew up because of Thor Ragnarok like in popularity and he was able to make Jojo Rabbit because he kept pitching Jojo Rabbit for years and no one picked it up and then he made Thor Ragnarok and suddenly Fox Searchlight was like oh we can trust your ability as a director we'll make your movie Um, yeah and and I know that's one of your favorite Marvel films right yeah and it's like um chloe zhao who directed eternals she had literally only directed three movies beforehand and they were all low budget indie films and so like you know marvel offers up that opportunity to work on a big budget movie with a lot of special effects and we'll get your name out there too if your movie performs well which it will like if it as long as it has the marvel logo on top of it the just slap that branding on there yeah the movie is going to perform well it doesn't matter like who's behind it and so it's like you know that would be a really cool opportunity so i'd love to make like maybe one or two indie films work on a marvel movie and then just sort of coast off the creative freedom that studios would allow me because they saw how well i can do on a marvel movie going back to indie films and that film that you just talked about about the the husband and the wife and the husband's a ghost and how it's shot i know that you have a deep love for analog and celluloid film would you love to do everything on film or would you think you would just have something more stylized in that way i would obviously love to shoot at least the footage analog a digital audio is almost perfected at this point in terms of what it can achieve i would think at least from like how I would use audio as a filmmaker. I don't know if the same can be spoken for with musicians, but with audio, like digital is fine. But with with visual, there's something kind of lost if you shoot it exclusively digitally. Now, I, I as much as I would love to shoot on film, it is excuse expensive. me, a much more a much more intensive project. Yeah. Because, like, Quentin Tarantino still shoots all of his movies on film, and that's, like, a requirement of him. And the studios shell out for it because, like, you know, all of his movies make money just because of his name and recognition. Um, And there's still some, like, filmmakers out there who are the same way, but not every one of them does that. Um, Zack Snyder, he also, like, shoots exclusively on film as well. There's a new method that's been hanging around recently. Uh, Denis Villeneuve has been known for doing this new technique and they used it recently on both uh dune part one and uh matt reeves the batman which just came out so it's kind of like a thing that warner brothers been trying to do and perfect where the movie is shot digitally they they color correct it they do all the special effects everything like that digitally and then once the movie's finished like in post-production they print that film onto 35 millimeter film as is and then scan that back in so it has the natural color and like grain and everything like that that comes with film can you see yourself doing that same technique i'd be willing to give that a shot um i think the batman is one of the most beautifully shot movies in recent memory um dune chapter one or dune part one was also really well shot um and i would even say uh blade runner 2049 like that's an, that's another Denis Villeneuve film and that was one where he did the same thing where he shot it digitally and then printed it on film and then scanned in the film and that movie is absolutely gorgeous like that movie is a test like if you were getting a new 4k tv and you wanted to test the capabilities of that tv watch Blade Runner 2049 because the color is on my Netflix list man yeah the the color spectrum available in that movie the way it's like neon soaked and the vibrancy of it it just exceeds like like it just like exceeds not like i guess it just bleeds out moodiness that vibe it would literally be a disservice to the movie to watch it in anything other than 4k (laughs) well then (laughs) my tv cannot do 4k but i know that probably when you you know you're gonna get a 4k tv for sure eventually i hope so 
4K has been existing in existence since like the early 2000s. It's, it's been playing in movie theaters since 2004. Well, would you say it's like optimized? Like that's the highest, I guess, film or like film recording can go, you know, like digital recording. Uh, for right now, um, there is one resolution higher than that called 8K, but 8K is not a very marketable one because you would literally need a TV the size of a movie theater projector. So it can't just simply be projected? Yeah, no. Like if you wanted it on a TV, you can't really do 8K and they might throw 8K on the labels, but it's still just 4K. Um, 4K is the most marketable high res like format you can use. Um, and even that's still like very high res. Some movies are shot in 8K and then mastered in 4K. Like Spider-Man Far From Home and Spider-Man No Way Home were both shot in 8K, but like they're available exclusively in 4K, like in home media formats. Like the only way you could watch it in 8K is if you're watching it in IMAX theaters. So what's the huge difference? Have you seen a film on 8K? No, I, I there's no IMAX theaters here in Iowa. I haven't had the pleasure of seeing any movie like an 8K. Mm. Does I I maybe does it like an 8K film being you know I guess turn into a 4K film? Does that just like degrade the quality from its original? I'm yeah. guessing so. You would think so, but because 4K is already a very high res image, like um it's 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 not a measurement of like how intense the pixels are i think that's where people get the misconception 4k is literally the size of the image like 4k means that it's 4000 pixels wide by i think 2160 pixels tall whereas a um a blu-ray would be at 1080p which is you know 1920 pixels by 1080 tall but because 4K is already a very high-res image and a very big image, even though you are technically downscaling it, it's still going to be highly detailed. Like, you're not really losing much in terms of image quality. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess tracking back to, you know, editing, editing style, for especially like movies like that on a huge budget, would you say that the editing that you will do that you do already is it stylized in a way that you don't know that you like is it stylized in a way after another director or editor or is any unexpected influence from in like a show or a medium that just like creeps into your editing so i've learned from ed doing fan edits specifically about like editing style and it's a very hard thing to define because visual language which is like a language i am pretty much fluent in like picking up on and i'm still trying to master speaking it myself um it's how an image talks to us and how images that are cut together sound mixing it all together how that speaks to us because there's there's little things that most people like can see visually like that's communicated to an audience through visual that you don't notice unless you know to look for it. And because I've been sitting here for so long, scanning through movies that I love, basically frame by frame, shot by shot, and seeing how it was put together, um, you know, compared to how I would have put it together or how other directors have put their movies together, I kind of get to see like how they do that. George Lucas's editing is more in how his editing goes in comparison with the script that he wrote mm -hmm. um you find that his scripts are kind of nonsensical when you read them and you can't really hear what he's going for in a lot of them and sometimes the scripts don't even match what ends up being on screen and he does this thing where in his stories he'll introduce one thing and so in in a new hope the we we pan down to the two ships coming in you know they fire and then it cuts to the inside of the one ship and then pans down and we see r2d2 and c3po they come in and it introduces you know darth vader from there darth vader introduces leia leia comes back to r2d2 and c3po and then we follow them down to the planet where they introduce us to tatooine they introduce uh, introduce us to the jawas and then luke and then you know that we there we meet our protagonist and it's like we are always consistently following one thing that we are familiar with 
to break us into this world because star wars would be so hard to follow if we didn't latch on to one small thing follow that to the next point and then like learn that and then follow that to the next point and we're just constantly following down this rabbit hole in editing he edits movies as if they were a visual form of music like everything is on a beat like there's a like, there's a in like like i guess in the chromatic with the the score of the film like if you yeah. get like a timpani hit that's like um a frame change or like a i guess uh, a jump to a next scene yeah the dialogue almost like is it's almost poetic it's almost like a dance sometimes his dialogue doesn't even have to like be good or sound good for it to still fit the scene you know like that scene where anakin and obi-wan are arguing before they fight in revenge of the sith like it's terrible dialogue but like literally when i'm sitting here like imagining what else that dialogue could be like it kind of ruins the tempo if you change it at all. Like, it, I don't know. It's weird. I, I've tried doing, like, like edits of, like, scenes in his movies. And it's just, like, it destroys the, like, the, the sense flow. of pacing. Yeah, the flow and the sense of pacing and the tempo and the rhythm of the video itself. And it's, like, I, I don't know. Like, I can, I can see it in the same way you can hear the subtleties in music mm -hmm. well in i guess for i guess a film that you said that you would like to do i think uh um i know that you asked me to help soundtrack and make a score for a couple scenes or maybe i don't know we'll figure something out but yeah. i know is like is there anything stylized you know more classical more uh, i guess you know, I guess uh, funk oriented because I know that you love like fun music for like a fun movie. Yeah, so I've determined that this movie takes place vaguely in the 1970s. Um, I have to say vaguely because I'm not trying to tie it down to any specific time period. I wanted to carry the aesthetic of the 1970s, but the characters still have like cell phones. You know <laughs> what I mean? Yeah, you just have that, like, I guess, just the vibe. Yeah. So I know, like, that's, like, the influence you would put in something, I guess, more fun. But is there an influence that you like to see, not only in scores, but, I guess, an influence in your own editing and directing that you like to pop up in your work? I, I know that I've said this before, but one of my favorite directors is Sam Raimi, and I just kind of want to influence his, or I want, I want to include almost his influence of horror comedy and like how he does like his shots um like I, a dark humor type of uh vibe yes and specifically i don't know if you've seen dr strange in the multiverse of madness yet i did i, I saw it recently oh cool cool so you know that scene where it was wanda versus the illuminati yes <laughs> it was very strange i'm not gonna lie <laughs> Well, okay, first off, that, that thing where, uh, where Reed is like, oh, Black Bolt can kill you with a, with a single whisper, and then she's like, what mouth? And then it, like, it's like a close-up of his eyes, and then pulls out, and you see he doesn't have a mouth, and he's like feeling his face. Yeah, when I saw the film, it was like very horror-oriented. like oriented. I remember talking to my brother in the, in the theater. Especially uh, when it has to do with like Captain Carter and what happens to her. Um, like when you see the shield come in for her midsection it literally is like the camera just flies into her midsection yeah and then, it, and then it cuts to a zoom in on her face and then she falls to the side you see her you see the shield like land in the wall and then you see her like hit the floor yeah like that's the kind of stuff like it's like visual storytelling um where it's very quick but it gets the point across so efficiently and it's like, I kind of want to imbue that, but I also want to infuse like Taiko Atiti's like energy level into it where everything's like, it's got like heart to it, you know, like Jojo Rabbit is both funny, but it also has like serious drama and it has a heart to it. And I want to just yeah. sort of include that level of care and attention into my characters and the film and the editing and the, you know, cinematography and all that. Mm-hmm. Okay, so continue about Taiko Tita's like 
Taika Waititi's, um, I guess, energy they put in his films and I like, guess like the fun in it, right? Because I've seen Jojo Rabbit and I see how much energy he puts into the characters, how much care, like personality they have. They just like pop like, like pop rocks or fireworks. Yeah. So like he obviously has like a sense of humor and that comes almost from like the visual side of it because like half a film is like visuals. And if you don't, if you don't try your best to be playful with it and like try to portray your story in an interesting way then you're literally just televising a novel almost because like one thing i I, one thing i can cite as a bad example of utilizing film specifically in animation because animation is like the purest form of expression in art because you're literally drawing what you want to see shows like family guy (laughs) <laughs> i i hate that show so much because it's literally just characters who are just done on flash animation where their their bodies are laid out in a bunch of vectors and then you just move their arms legs and then the, you know swap out the different shapes of their mouths they have like a taco model of the like each character right yeah and it's it's kind of a disgrace to the art form of animation because you're not doing anything interesting you're literally just writing jokes and then using the visuals of those characters as a vehicle to tell the jokes it's not anything interesting unique and it doesn't have any like interesting like perspectives to talk about and so like that would be a bad example of that whereas taika is capable of telling a joke exclusively through visual medium like in jojo rabbit when jojo finally rejects hitler and he, you know, says "f off, Hitler," and kicks him and through he the kicks window. Out of the window. Yeah, like that's funny. <laughs> it's just because of the way he goes flying out the window. Um, or I, I would even cite Edgar Wright because Edgar Wright does this beautifully. Um, he does a lot of like whip pans that are integrated into his editing. Um, one of my favorite jokes from him that I will always cite as like a great example of visual comedy is that scene in Scott Pilgrim versus the world when um, Knives Chow comes up to the door and Wallace answers and she goes, is Scott here? And he goes, uh, you know what? Scott dives through the window and he goes, he just left. <laughs> <laughs> well, like, I guess like, like that's, that's yeah, like that, that, that's good. Work, that's like, good stuff right there. Like, you know, that that storytelling just by just doing a simple it's almost like slastic you know but like that progresses the story yeah like it it goes back to the days of like buster keaton and charlie chaplin where like their work was entirely visual and they didn't even have sound to rely on they yeah, couldn't tell they like couldn't those, tell dialogue jokes shows. yeah and so i would almost argue that like charlie chaplin and buster keaton did stuff that was almost akin to live action animation because like theirs was the purest form of expression because they could only express through their body language and how they chose to compose the shots and edit them and it's just like that's the kind of stuff that I want to portray on screen it's just a a complete image of expression has there been shows that like or movies that had used animation and just completely just you know flying colors amazing i guess that visual storytelling that you were just itching about a while ago yeah there's there's quite a few of them to be honest um uh spider-man to the spider-verse is always going to be one that i that comes to mind in terms of like what is the best kind of animation um because it 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 knows what it wants to achieve visually and then it masters both 3d and 2d animation simultaneously then there's shows like BoJack Horseman, which do also use vector animation, and Rick and Morty. Rick and Morty also uses vector animation um, to achieve its like image. Uh, but those ones do it differently, because they, they don't just let it fall into character is standing here, says joke, next scene. Amazing World of Gumball is just a treasure trove of animation styles. Like, oh, yeah. Using 3D rendered objects, like the T-Rex and everything, and 2D. But also, I think, don't they use, like, rotoscope? I, I don't use, remember if they use rotoscope in that show as well. Yeah, uh, Saucy is done with, like, rotoscoping the bottom of someone's mouth with, like, googly eyes on the chin. Or, like, um, the character Clayton is literally done in stop-motion animation. Yeah, just 
bonkers mash of like everything do you think you can would like to like pull something close to that you know just this mash of mediums yeah and also smiling friends that's another good example because that one used that one uses like vector animation hand-drawn animation rotoscope stop motion 3d animation live action like it uses all of it Mm -hmm. one topic i would i don't think i've discussed with you but i'm really excited to know your reaction to this or to this question would you like to go to a film festival like cam or like sundance oh absolutely that'd be so fun would you like to maybe premiere a film like you're making at those type of film festivals like what's your take on those i've never gone to one but i would i would love to do that like i honestly because like if you see those movies where it says like oh like a sundance you know like premiering at sundance or something like that like People usually see those as good movies, you know, or at least like interesting movies. Yeah. Okay. One last thing before we wrap up our little interview. What are you doing in this photo? Uh oh, I'm wearing the headset. So you caught me while I was at work. I was I was calling. Your remote phone line you were calling or who you were calling? I I no, I don't I don't remember. Cause honestly. I I've been working at for the better part of like two years basically at this point and like you know how many people I've called I've you know how many programs I've called I've called at least 15 different programs and I call hundreds of people a day you know like I can't remember all those names and all those conversations yeah well thank you very much for you know, helping me, you know, of course, be my editor and the editor of this video and also joining me alongside in this thing of Ricablo. Thank <laughs> you very much, Jake. It was wonderful talking to you. Hopefully we can maybe have another interview some other time. Yeah, that'd be cool. All right. Take care then. <laughs> you too.